Let me see, and yeah, mm hmm yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot of stuff out there. One thing that I find though with this book as um, we go, we kind of get some repeats of stuff. And in one way, I guess that could be annoying because it's like, hey, we already talked about this, but then you kind of get it again and you're like, oh, like, okay, the more I hear this, the more I see it, the more I read it, kind of the more it helps it to stick. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm glad that the lecture helped. I, I try to keep my energy high in those and I try to give you pictures and, um, you know, those kinds of things. Um, in my ground lectures, I have like um, questions embedded in the lecture. So as we go, it's like, you guys all have whiteboards and it's like, okay, here's a, here's a question, you know, what are your answers? And just to kind of break it up a little bit, make it a little bit more interactive. Thanks, I'll try. I, try to put more pictures in there um, just to give us an idea of maybe what the, the little creature looks like and then what it could manifest itself as in the body. I think that helps me to kind of connect the dots um, because I'm definitely visual, although as one of my students pointed out, I'm an audio uh, learner as well, which has to be true because I can hear a song once and know all the words, so that must be kind of true. Um, yeah, so packed full of goodness. Um, I think fungi are interesting. I think they're interesting. Um, actually have um, a video for us. Yeah, Rainy, I agree. It's kind of hard to connect what they do with what, what their names are. I agree with that for sure. Um, it is kind of helpful as the diagnosis, but not just taking the name of the, the organism and being able to kind of say it does this uh, for the most part. That's kind of um, confusing for sure. Um, I found a video on um, rhino cerebral um, mucormycosis and that's like a nasal endoscopy. It's not over the top thrilling but I think it's interesting just the view we get and we can see some of the instrumentation that's used. So we'll go ahead and watch that. Um, the plan for today, um, there, there wasn't any frequently missed questions. Uh, for the post-test, so we don't have any of those to cover. Um, but I do have that video for you, and we'll watch that. And then here's my idea for the rest of the class. We'll probably um, finish up early today so that you'll have time to type up your lab notes. Um, but we're going to kind of take part of uh, uh, under the microscope questions. Well, we're going to use some of those, and I have some other tidbits that we're going to kind of smush into there, and we're going to kind of make that our discussion and our lab. And as we get into the program and we start talking more about procedure-specific stuff, you'll have to complete um, case preparedness records is what they're called, CPRs, and it's everything about a procedure. So my thought was we could kind of introduce that today, deconstruct it, talk about um, a specific organism that causes a specific disease that would lead to surgery and what that surgery looks like and kind of mix all of those things in that we've been talking about. And then um, I'll give you time outside of class to um, type up that uh, case preparedness record. So I already uh, attached the document to today's lab and it's very simple. This is what it looks like. I don't know if you can see it, but it's just, it's very simple and it asks you the parts of the procedure. Um, and it, you can just, you know, type it out on there. And um, that is what you'll submit for your lab. So that'll be like a transfer of your lab notes to there. So, you know, jot down some things as we go. And then you'll already have some things because I'm going to divide you up into groups so that you can find each of these parts. And then we'll come back together and we'll discuss all of those parts. And then you should have everything that you need.
Okay, so that's my plan for today. And then of course, we'll finish up with our Kahoot. Um, and then there's a post test there. Um, everything that was turned in as of 4 a.m. <laughs> is graded. Um, so I'm trying to keep up with that and uh, give you timely feedback. I did make it through all of the threaded discussions for week two and responded to every single person with uh, something something. So check out the little gift that I left you. Um, you know, and I always appreciate any responses that you guys have. I look forward to those. Um, before we watch the video, questions, concerns, comments on the material, anything specific or whatever that you would like to discuss, um, you know, anything that needs demystifying. I think it's pretty straightforward just talking about the organism and the disease that it causes. But if there's questions, let's, let me see, let me see. Wait, is this about microbiology? Okay, does the grading pertain to resubmitted deliverables one? No, not those, Ian, thank you for asking. So as I was sharing with Tammy, um, my plan is while you're taking your midterms tomorrow to get those regraded for you. So that'll be my goal um, at um, 8 a.m. tomorrow morning, I'll start working on those. If not sooner, if I get time today, I'll start working on those today. Mm hmm yep, of course. You're welcome, thank you, I appreciate it. Um, anything, anything else out there about the material before we watch a video? Did you think it is weird that enterococci are dome-shaped? Well, no, not enterococci, the um, viridians. The viridians group, did you read that? That they're dome-shaped. I couldn't really find a good picture of, dome, of a dome-shaped streptococci to put on there. And uh, it mentions that they have, yeah, but I couldn't really find anything good, but I thought that was interesting that they make like a dome shape, which is kind of something that we haven't really talked about before. And apparently it doesn't have a weird name. They just call it dome shaped. So that's nice. That's my takeaway for the whole thing. Okay, let me share this video with you and then we will go from there. Okay, hold on one sec. <sighs> Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Let's see. I think this should get me there. Mm -hmm. Well, this doesn't have closed caption. It has nice relaxing music. So welcome to the nose. That's a turbinate right there. See that big thing on the right? Right here? That's one of those turbinates or concha, one of those bones that are in there. And this is the septum over here. All right, and then this would be the sidewall or the inside of the ala or the nares. And there is the infection. You see it there? And then there's some here. He's gonna be snipping that out. So when they're doing this, I'm gonna turn down the relaxing music just a little bit so that I can narrate over that. Um, that's a curette that they're using right there. That's called a curette. And um, it is meant for scraping uh, tissue. Um, but what I was gonna say is when they're doing this, not only do they have a scope inside the nose, they're gonna have their, their instrument that they're working with inside the nose as well. And most of the time, they have a camera attached to that scope that is going to be attached to a monitor. So that way, um, you get to see what's going on in there as well, okay? Which is nice, because it's always boring uh, if they're using a microscope or something and there isn't any way for you to see, uh, you know, and to the oculars or whatever. So, um, the thing about working in the nose, right? There is a, 
a fine line between what separates nose and brain. So when we're working in the nose, something that you want to be cognizant of is if you see clear fluid draining into the nose. If that's the case, that could be um, cerebrospinal fluid. And that is bad. And uh, we would have to patch that up. So you always want to be aware of that. Uh, we don't really put anything in and out of the nose. The surgeon pretty much does that. So see what he's using now or she? That is a burr. And uh, it's like a high-speed Dremel tool, which is used to um, contour and shave the bone. And they use these in several different um, orthopedic cases and ENT cases, feet, whatever. Um, but you can see it's just like this high-speed Dremel tool. There's all different sizes, shapes, um, different um, uh, levels of aggressiveness um, to, the, to those. And those tips are um, single use only. So the part that you insert the burr in, that's reusable, of course, but the, um, the actual drill or burr part, that's a single use that gets um, tossed into the sharks when you're done. And typically we don't count those burrs, but. With these cases, as far as instrumentation, you're gonna have a variety of, see these little biters that he's using? Ones that are straight, ones that swoop to the left, swoop to the right, swoop up, swoop down, right angle uh, to the left, you know, 90 to the right, whatever the case may be. And there's no special name. They'll just be like, you know, can I get a 90 degree right and you'll pass that? Or, you know, can I get an up slope or a left slope or whatever. Now this hasn't invaded the superficial tissue, but there are some images in the book and there are situations where um, it can actually get into the eye and the orbit and the nasal bones and it can cause, like it can necrose the tissue and the eye and um, nose face can all be black and rotting away because of, um, because of this fungi. This is probably one of those procedures where you'll have some cocaine soaked sponges and you're going to put them up the nose uh, just for a topical anesthetic, uh, analgesic, before um, they actually start the case. And this is not a sterile procedure. Um, remember, any, uh, any system or tract that has an opening to the outside world is not considered a sterile environment. So can you see how that sponge looks just like tissue? Can you guys confirm that? If, you know, if you're not really careful and you don't know that he stuffed two sponges up the nose, then when you look in there, you can't really even distinguish it from the tissue, the surrounding tissue. So that is really critical that um, you're keeping track of those because can you see how it just disappears in there? That might be some sort of uh, hemostatic agent, but I can't, 
tell if it's a sponge or if it's like Surgicel or something like that that is gonna leave in there. Look at that side, looks all beautiful. That's the other side. There's this. You've got a flower at the end. Okay. All right. Did you like it? Did you like looking up the nose? <laughs> right? There's lots of bleeding. The nose bleeds a lot. <laughs> you will grow to love it, Rainy. How deep does it go? All the way back to the brain. <laughs> That's why you gotta be careful not, not to stick your finger in too far because you could like literally poke through to your brain. Yeah, that's not good. That's why little kids shouldn't pick their nose. Yeah, right? Exactly, the flu test is the same. Oh my gosh, that was awful experience. I was gonna punch the guy. Him pulling out the fungi okay. though, it really looked like he was pulling out his brain. <laughs> they don't tell you that's coming either. At least he didn't tell me. It's like, okay. Um, so any um, aha moments or comments about the video at all? I have a question about the... Um him putting the sponges up the nose and you said there may be some that he leaves in there so how does that process work I mean because it looked like some of them he kind of shoved up and back in there for a little while and then retrieved them gave them a minute to soak in whatever was going on but then he pulled them back out but you said there's also some that get left in there yeah not sponges but um like a heat some sort of hemostatic agent and some of those can actually look like that that he put in at the end. I couldn't tell um, if he did leave it in, then I'm guessing it's some sort of hemostatic agent that'll eventually, the body will just dissolve it and break it down, but to help with bleeding. Um, so um, typically they don't leave sponges in there, but they might put in some sort of hemostatic agent. But it's always good, same with um, when you're working in the belly, to um, let the team know when one goes in. Or you can even, like, you're going to have a marking pin. I always just write it, like, with my marking pin on my back table cover. That's like a gigantic area for you to write on, right? So you're going to be like, you know, sponges with a line. And then if one goes in, put one. And if it comes out, cross it out. If another one goes in, put one. You know, that way you can keep track of what goes in there. Same with the belly. Because when they're working in the belly, they're going to want like moistened laps. Like you're going to wet a whole bunch of laps and wring them out like really good. And they're going to pack the abdomen with them. They're going to kind of wall off whatever they don't want, um, you know, getting in their business, getting in their way. Um, and so there could be a fair amount of lap sponges in there and you want to keep track of what goes in and what comes out. So um, another thing that they also do is they will put in um, what we call nasal tampons. Now, sometimes they call them nasal splints, but they're literally like a tampon <laughs> with a straw in the center, right? So you can still breathe. So um, that's basically what it's like. You know, if you have a bloody nose, a tampon will work in a pinch. Um, but uh, yeah, so they'll put those in, or you know, if, if it's just one side, they'll put them in on the operative side or whatever. Um, and then they can take those out later in the office, which I heard is super painful. So I don't ever want that to happen to me either. Um, let me see what Ian says. <laughs> it did seem like there was a lot they were pulling out 
Yeah, and I think because of the camera, ma it magnifies that field. Like, like what is like the the size of the end of my pen right here is like magnified to like this, right? Because it's like finger size, right? And it's like making it really big. So when it comes out, it's probably just going to be like a little, a little bite. Right, but not um, not huge like it looks. So yeah, I think it's more um, perspective than than anything because it does magnify the field um, several times over. Um, yeah, so that's due to infection. So if you look in the book, the book talks about. Um, I was trying to fix pick one that had some sort of surgical thing. So um, the mucor mycotina. Um, and actually, I think, yeah, um, zygomycota is the same thing. So that's the fungus. That's on page 158 if you want to look at it. But that um, beast causes um, the mucor mycosis. And so that's what that patient has. And then that, um, the picture that's there on page 159 of that woman, figure 11.5, that is a result of that same fungus and it can continue to progress until it kills the eye, kills the nasal bone, kills the orbit, you know, it can just, and then if it, it because if it gets into the nasal sinuses and it's, it's eroding the bone, then it can get into the brain, and then it can do the same thing to the brain, which is really bad. Yeah, so rhinocerebral, cerebral uh, mucor mycosis. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep. It's pretty scary. It's pretty frightening, isn't it? And the easiest way, um, yeah, yeah. I tried to, I thought I did put that on the, um, the lecture, the one that was like more extensive. I go for shock and awe, you know? The grosser, the better. I'm like, oh, I gotta find one that's really gross. <laughs> so I'll be like, oh man, when they watch it. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? Right? Exactly. Shock and awe. I can remember uh, AST. Every year, um, or twice a year, they have workshops, and you can go and you can get continuing education credits, whatever. And uh, usually they're so boring, you really want to die. And um, this particular one, well, there's two that stand out. One where we got to dissect eyeballs, which was awesome. Um, but the other one that stuck out was a surgeon, and they'll usually have like several speakers, um, but there was a, I don't know if she was a general surgeon or what she was, I can't remember, but her whole topic was um, to amputate or not to amputate. And so she would, sh she showed like from her own um, like cases that she had worked on, like these horrific traumas to, to arms and legs and feet and hands. And then the question would be, okay, so do we amputate or do we not? And she would kind of give a little bit of history. And then she would ask us to raise our hands, like, okay, how many says we should amputate? And you're like, amputate or not amputate, you know? And then she would kind of go on to say what they did and why and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, yeah, we're surge techs. We want to see surgery. Like, that's what we do. I don't want to you to try to sell me a Da Vinci robot. I just want to see what surgery you do with the robot. So. So yeah, definitely stands out. <laughs> Give me the blood, Lord. Indeed, indeed. Uh, I did have one student in the past that said he wanted to be a surge tech because he liked horror movies. And uh, he figured surgery would be the same. And I'm like, well, we really don't like it when surgery is like a horror movie. Like we try to keep it, you know, controlled. Um, but uh, yeah, I get the connection for sure. All right, what else? What else about this content? Anything else? Let me kind of take a look through the gram positive cockeyed thing, cockeyed part, cockeyed. I don't know, something to do with your eyes. Um,
What I thought was crazy is that, you know, if left go, was it the aspergillus? I'm back on fungus. Fungus just is like so interesting to me that it can, uh, with, with those that have tuberculosis, and it leaves like these little cavities in their lungs, these little tubercles, that aspergillus can actually get in there and grow and cause these big fungus fur balls. That's crazy. I tried to find one of those fungus balls for you guys, but I, I really couldn't find one. I was starting to go down a rabbit hole, so I had to pull myself back in. But um, yeah, aspergillus, that's just nasty. It can grow, grow in our blood vessels and block our blood vessels and block our sinuses and, and all kinds of stuff. And how do we get this? We breathe it in. So don't go stirring up anything and breathing it in, you know, like bat poop or, you know, like anything like that, especially bat poop or chicken coop, poop, nothing. Don't do it. Don't the furry do it. strawberries were disturbing. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's doing an experiment with strawberries. Is that, is it Adriana? Is that you, Adriana? Somebody's doing one with strawberries. And when I saw that, it made me think of it. Oh, Jackie. Okay, Jackie. Yeah. Uh, so when I saw that, I'm like, oh, I thought of your experiment. Black mold, right? Yeah, that stuff can grow in our houses and our walls. My parents had it, one of the houses that they owned um, in their closet. And so their whole closet had to be like ripped apart and, you know, fixed and everything. And, and then for a while, anything my mom had, she blamed it on the black mold. I don't know. I don't know if there's a connection. I got a hangnail. It's the black mold. I don't know. Could have been. Okay. Um, so let's start talking about our main topic for today. So if you turn in your book to 180, 180, those are the microscope questions that we're going to be working on. And then I have other fun stuff as I'm going to divide you into five groups today. And I'm going to give you a little bit more time than I typically do. And I'll come around and check on you, or you know what I mean, figuratively. Um, because this is going to be uh, probably uncharted territory in some aspects. Um, but that's okay, because we're going to be talking about supplies, we're going to look at instrumentation, some different stuff that we really haven't looked at before, but I think it will be a good fact-finding mission and kind of tie us back to why we're here in the first place. Um, so having said that, um, there, um, there is one other sub-principle that I want to go over before we start this whole thing. So I'm going to switch to that really quickly. We'll go over that, then I'll break you into groups. I'll give you the material that you're going to cover, and then I'll send you to your rooms, we'll come back, and then we'll have our discussion. Okay, that'll be our plan. So um, maybe what we'll do is after I talk about the last sub-principle, I'll give you a break at that point, and then we can come back, I'll have the rooms, um, if you just stay logged in, I can do the rooms while you're gone, and then we'll go from there. All right, that way you can get your break before we start this next part. Okay? All right, kiddos, let's see. We're going here, and um, I think we pretty much talked about, like, the next three for today, as I kind of jump the gun, but I think the more we here are these, the better. Um, so where we're supposed to start today is, um, let's see, this one here. If a sterile package is wrapped in a pervious woven material, drops to the floor, this can allow for the implosion of air into the package, and this would be considered contaminated. So what's the difference between pervious and impervious? Can anybody tell me that? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, pervious means permeable. Absolutely. So impervious, the op opposite of that, right? So when I think of impervious, I think of something that's not really going to let water through, right? And then something that's pervious probably is. So like our plastic stuff, water and air can't really push through there for impervious stuff, but for pervious stuff, it probably can. So if we're talking about a situation where we have a surgical gown and the surgical gown comes in that outside plastic, right? That like dust cover, dust jacket, they call it. If that were to fall on the floor, that plastic cover is impervious. So we can essentially, if we're going to use it for that case, pick it up, just check the integrity, make sure it's still okay, open it up, take it out. Now we're holding it and it's wrapped in that paper, right? And that paper is the pervious wrapping, okay? Because if I were to pour some water on that, eventually it's going to soak through or air could be pushed through if we dropped it. So if we had it and we took it out of that plastic wrap and then it got dropped onto the floor, we don't want to pick it up and use it for our field. Okay, does that make sense? Questions about that, the difference between pervious and impervious, perviousness? Okay, um, let me see what Ian says. Um, I would say the majority of it is going to be fairly impervious. Or if something is a, a wrapped in a pervious material, it's going to also be covered in some sort of dust jacket that is impervious. Like our back table packs, those all come in that plastic jacket, um, those kinds of things. Um, good question. Honestly, I think this, uh, it used to be that they would use cloth to wrap things and sterilize them in. Like uh, one example is muslin. And muslin is a very high thread count material. And they would use that and they would double wrap whatever it was. Was it towels that were processed in house or whatever the case may be. Um, there isn't really a benefit for pervious stuff because it's more easily breached than impervious stuff. But a long time ago, we used to use that and probably in most, if not all developing countries, they're using that stuff. Um, they use cloth gowns, they use uh, cloth drapes. All of those are more pervious, although they're treated with like a chemical that's supposed to help retard fluid. Um, they're not nearly as retardant at, as, um, as like our paper drapes. Does that help? Awesome. You're welcome. Any other questions? Okay, so moving on to punctures, tears, or uh, strike through. Um, if there is any breach in the integrity, then we need to get rid of it or we need to fix it, right? So destruction of the integrity of the barrier by pump, by holes, rips, tears, wet marks, strike through any of that, um, that would be a breach in, in um, in its sterility, right? It'd be contaminated. So let's talk a little bit more about, um, strike through. So strike through has to do with fluid and wetness. If, uh, let's see, like I was saying, most of our drapes are semi-impervious, which means if you let something wet sit on it long enough, it has the potential to soak through. 
So let's say we are doing a case and we, ha you know, we have the drapes on our patient, but it's a really bloody case. And the drapes are like covered with blood or there's areas where they're saturated with blood. There is the risk that the, eventually the moisture can soak through that drape and if it penetrates to the other side, that is called strike through and that creates a path for microorganisms. They can use that fluid path to then crawl and scratch their way into our sterile field, okay? So if you spill something on the field, let's say um, you get some saline irrigation in your bucket and you accidentally bump your table and a little splashes onto it, that's fine. Get a towel, dry it up, and then just discard the towel. Um, or, you know, a towel is probably best. You could use a sponge, but remember sponges are for count. So you would want to, uh, we use kick buckets for those, right? If we, when we throw them off the field. So you could uh, potentially use a sponge and throw it off the field. But if something spills on the field, you want to dry it up right away the best that you can. And if you're in a case that's like drawing on like six hours and the drapes are visibly saturated with blood, you might want to suggest another drape to put over it, okay, at some point. Same with your gown. Um, there have been times when we've been in really long cases and the surgeon takes off one particular time. She took off her gown and her entire scrubs were like just all bloody. Um, you know, because eventually, um, at first, if you like take a gown and you pour some water on it, you're going to see it beat up and roll off. But if it sits on there and it's in constant contact, it's going to cause strike through. Yeah, so she was, she's pretty much contaminated. Um, so, uh, and that also <laughs> goes with um, surgeons that sweat a lot. Because if they sweat a lot, eventually they can sweat through their gowns. Um, and that's not good either. Or as surge techs, we can sweat a lot too. Um, you know, so you just want to be aware of those things. Questions about strike through? Okay, that next one pretty much goes along with it. If a permeable drape covers a table or sterile field and any liquid penetrates the drape from above or below, it's considered contaminated. We don't typically cover things with pervious drapes, not here in the United States. If you're going to do a medical mission to Africa, that might be a different scenario, okay? But pretty much here, although with um, the difficulty we're having getting um, sterile gowns, uh, disposable ones, um, there are a couple hospitals here in the Valley that said, um, our students could complete their clinicals there if they brought their own gowns, which has never happened ever because you don't want to bring outside stuff into the OR, but they're allowing that because they don't have them, um, or they're starting to use cloth gowns. So that's pretty crazy. Okay, questions about these. Those are our three for today, um, but we've kind of talked in and around them, so I just kind of wanted to clarify those. Questions? And stop sharing. Yeah, okay, thanks, Ian. All right, um, what am I doing? I don't wanna do that. Let me give you a break. Why is my little share screen came up? Let me close that one for water. Um, so it looks like it's not quite 945. So if you want to take about 10 minutes, um, that would put us at like five till 10. Um, and then we'll come back. We'll talk about our um, group activity. Okay. All right. I will see you in 10.
Okay, so that kind of sets the stage for the rest of this story. Um, thank you, Jonathan. Appreciate that and your group. Um, Talman is our group leader for um, group two. And you guys were talking about supplies. So um, do any of you need to share your screen? Yes, I do. Anyone? Anyone? Yes. Ari Ariana, you're going to share? OK. I'm making you the hostess. OK, you are ready to go. I wasn't um, in a group with Tom, and I was in a group with, I was group three. Uh, OK, so we're with group one. We're with group two. We're in group two. So who's leading group two? Tom. Okay. Do you need to share your screen? Yes, I do. Okay. One second. Let me switch that. Okay, you should be good to go. Um, showing on my screen. So down at the bottom, you should have a little, it says, gr it's a little green arrow that says share screen. On my end, uh, it just says Zoom, like when you're uh, like first logging on to Zoom and you're before the lecture starts, it kicked me out. Are you on a computer? Yeah, I am. Hmm. All I see is the Zoom logo and that's it. You might have to like, I don't know what kind of laptop you have, but sometimes it'll do that. And then I have to like find the, the meeting again as like a little icon, like for my Mac, it's down at the bottom or um, like in your little task bar at the bottom. Ah, okay, no, I got it, sorry. <laughs> Awesome. Okay, He's so done. the disposable disposable items used for the uh, BMT uh, procedure are sterile cotton balls, prepping solution, uh, suction tips, and suction tubing, drapes, gauze, a uh, draining tube, which is also called a tympanostomy tube, and that looks like this. Oh yeah, the PE tubes. Uh, a towel, four towels draping around the head. And a mastoid dressing, which is the picture is shown right here. Well, I guess this one. The guy's head wrapped. Uh, same solution and the Glasscock dressing, which is uh, this dressing right here looks like a headband and cotton budgets. But I don't have that pictured. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. That's it. That's it. That looks pretty good. Um, the P those little tubes that you showed, the Tim Panostomy tubes. Yeah. Sometimes we also refer to those as P as in Paul, E as in equal. So pressure equalization tubes. Um, so you might also see it written as BMT with PE tubes. Um, so just so you know, that's what that means. Um, on our field, we might also need just some four by four sponges, maybe Raytex. We don't count for this procedure. So we typically just use like gauze sponges um, for it. Um, you'll also need some gloves for your surgeon. Oh, uh, yes. That. Um, and gloves for yourself. Um, you know, they don't ever think about us, so we have to think about ourselves. 
Um, and then you might also want like a marking pen and some labels. That's um, one thing. And then like a mayo stand cover so that we can set up our, um, our mayo stand with all of our goodies. Um, we don't use any blade. Uh, well, the, the Mirangatami knife that we use, it can be a non-disposable thing. So really a scalpel. We don't use a scalpel. Um, we don't use any suture for this procedure. Um, and for the draping, we typically just wrap the, the head with towels for the draping. So there's not a whole lot of draping that goes into it. Um, yeah, good job. Excellent job. Did you say B-U-T tubes or B-E-T tubes? B-U-T-T. -T. No, okay. just kidding. That would be <laughs> Let's type it in. P-E tubes. Like that. P-E standing for pressure equalization tubes. It's those little blue little jobbies. And they come in all different shapes and sizes, those PE tubes. And a lot of times the surgeon will want to like trim them because they have like a long, they're like longer. Um, and so sometimes the surgeon might alter them a little bit before they put them in, but yeah, mm -hmm, you're welcome. Good job. Sweet. Questions about the supplies. It's a pretty good list. Good job. Okay, moving on. I'm going to steal back the host. Okay. Um, group three, that is Sarah's group. They're covering instruments and equipment. And Sean's and gonna share his screen. Sean's gonna share. That's so nice of you, Sean, to share. I thought so. Okay, you're ready <laughs> whenever you are. You gotta cross your head a little bit there. <laughs> oh, yeah. What do we got here? This is, oh crap, I just lost it. So for the kit, it has the Jobson horn probe. Um, then there's the ear specula tip sizes, four millimeters, five millimeter, millimeters, and six millimeters. Mm -hmm. And then the marine otomy knife. Mm -hmm. Then there's the suction tube, 16 gauge and 20 gauge a suction controller, and the micro ear floor sets. Nice. So to the far left, those are the ear specula, those little black, like, um, you know, Barbie's megaphone. <clears throat> and you're going to have several sizes of those um, in your tray. And what you're going to pull is called a meringotomy tray or a BMT tray for the most part. Um, and so it'll have those little specula in there. Um, and the, the little narrow part is what goes in to the ear. And then a lot of times there's like a special device that's going to lock onto the bed that's going to hold that speculum in place. Or sometimes the surgeon will just hold it, but they're gonna work through that little opening, right? It's gonna be right down next to the um, uh, tympanic membrane. And then the little probes are there. Um, there's also, let's see, from going from the left, not the first long one or the second one, but the third one, that's a little ear curette. And um, that's going to be used to like get the wax out of the ear because there's probably going to be like some schmutzy stuff in there. Um, so the surgeon's going to like want to clean that out. And so that's what that curette is good for. And um, this little forcep right here that has the rings, um, that's what we typically call the alligator forcep. And it has like little jaws on the end that do this. And that's what they're gonna use to grab the tube and put the tube in. 
But this is pretty much, this is the first case that we will do uh, together as a group. We'll do a Meringotomy. Very simple, very easy setup, knife, fork, spoon, my friend used to say. Um, and this is basically all that we need to have. So yeah, good job. That is our sterile stuff. Somebody's drawing um, three lines on there. What about any equi equipment? Did you find any non-sterile equipment? Uh, no, I don't think we got that far. Okay, so for non-sterile equipment, we need something to hook our suction tube to. So we're definitely gonna need a suction machine, all right? We call that the suction apparatus, all right? So there's gonna need to be some sort of suction source, um, and they, they are also gonna use a microscope. So that's a big part of it as well, the microscope. Um, and typically added to these sterile items are going to be microscope handles. And those are gonna screw onto the microscope and allow the surgeon to like manipulate and adjust the microscope because they're not gonna be able to see the tympanic membrane with their eyes. They're gonna have to use a scope to do that. So you'll have to bring that microscope into the, um, into the room you know, um, in preparation for your case. Those are the two biggest things I can think of. Mm -hmm. Good. All right, if you want to, um, like, do you have anything else to share, Sean, or? I do not. Okay, thank you for sharing. Questions about the types of instruments or equipment that we're going to use. Um, one other thing that I just thought of as I was kind of looking at my notes here is when we look at the orientation of the operating room table, let me take you on a virtual tour. Let me see if I can um, show you. Um, let's see. Let me just do a quick Google search for an operating room table. Operating room table. All right. Feast your eyes upon this baby. Okay, can everybody see this OR table that I have pulled up here? Just want to confirm. Can someone? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so when we do BMTs, the surgeon is going to sit um, at the side, at the head of the patient. So the surgeon, if you can imagine, this is where the patient's head's going to be, right? This is the head of the table. There's going to be a stool right here. Surgeon's going to sit here. And when we, um, uh, when they start, they're going to start on one side, they're going to do that ear, and then if it's bilateral, stool's going to get moved over to the other side, they're going to do the other ear. Sometimes this base right here, and it doesn't really look like it from this image, but can be in the way of their feet. So sometimes what we'll do is we'll have to turn uh, this entire bed all the way around. Um, so this head is going to go 180, turn it around, it's going to end up here. And this part, can you see how there's a little break right there? This comes off and it will actually go in here. So we're going to turn it around. That way the base is going to be over here now. It's going to be flipped around. And then we just bring that little head piece back up to the top. And that way that gets that base out of uh, the way of the surgeon's feet. Anytime we're working on the head, we, we have a tendency, if they're going to be sitting, they do for tonsils sometimes too, um, to turn that base. Let me see what Sean says. Do you know how to sew, Sean? Can you sew us something? <laughs> I can't, no. <laughs> but my mother-in-law sews my pants together every day because those scrubs do not work well when you bend down. <laughs> oh, yeah, they're not very forgiving, are they? 
Well, um, I don't sew either, so. Um, so, uh, having said so, uh, so this, this is what we would have to change the positioning of the table. And this happens a lot for procedures that we do where we have to manipulate the table, move parts, move it around. One thing that you do want to be aware of that is an interesting little tidbit is when we turn this bed around and the base is at the other end, the, the um, amount of weight that the bed can hold gets cut in half. So if this bed can hold a thousand pounds in its regular orientation, when you turn it, it can only hold 500. Now, if we're doing a baby, that's not a big deal. But if we're doing, a, you know, a big old kid, <laughs> that might make a difference. But that's just something to kind of tuck away. Okay? Okay. That's all I got. All right, any questions or comments about that? Okay, thank you so much, Sarah, Sean, your group. Um, we're gonna move on to Tori's group and they hopefully found a little video for us um, and then they're gonna talk about positioning and drugs. Yes. So I did find a video. I'll go over the positioning and drugs first. Um, the video is really short and sweet. It's only like two minutes. So um, I'll just go over those two first and then I'll play the video for you guys. Um, so for the positioning, um, it's going to be a supine um, face up uh, with the arms tucked at the side. Um, and then for the drugs, um, other than obviously anesthesia, so there is saline used. Um, which was listed as one of the items for the procedure. Um, and then they also will apply um, a otic solution. So it's usually an antibiotic. Um, and it looked like it was most commonly a ciprofloxacin. And they'll either use it intra or postoperatively. Nice. And then the cotton ball to hold those drops in. Mm -hmm to make sure that it stays in there and works. Yep. All right. And then am I the hostess with the mostest? I'm going to make you that right now. Okay. Okay. Now you're the hostess with the mostest. Okay. All right. I hope this works. If you guys can't hear anything, let me know, please. I hear something. You guys hear that okay? I'm just seeing like the intro page at this point. No. Let's see what I can do here. Um, maybe the closed caption, yeah, but it's just... Yeah, I just turned them on here. Let me just uh, restart it here because I don't think it's going to let me share audio if I have my headphones in and I can't take them off. If you want to so. send me the link, I could always try. Can you? Okay. Yeah, just because I... It's just better if you can hear the audio. Let me just copy it real quick and send it to you. Um, and I'll stop sharing too. Okay. I'll just uh, post it in the chat, Miss Windsor. Yeah, that would be perfect. Okay, there it is. Okay, I'm gonna take back the hostess privileges. It was nice to have the power for a short period of time. <laughs> oh, and you didn't hit end meeting, so that was good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me see if I copied it. Yeah, okay. All right, let's see here. Let me share my screen now. And, oh. That's not what I wanted to do. This one. Okay. This short instructional video outlines. Thank you, Ms. Winter. You're welcome. Air Academy with PE2 placement. 
there are many indications for tympanostomy tube placement in adults and children. Most commonly, PE tubes are placed for persistent effusion with conductive hearing loss, recurrent otitis media. Less commonly, they may be placed for treatment of ulnary station tube dysfunction associated uh, to pedic membrane retraction. This is a right ear shroom that is removed with a curette. Aha, I knew it. Our biggest job is going to be to wipe off the curette. The inferior tympanic membrane is visualized. It's a pretty good view. Here comes the knife. The linear neurongotomy is made just large enough to accommodate the PE tube. There's no fluid. Any middle ear effusion is suctioned. More unnecessary surgery. Okay, maybe I see some now. A PE tube is placed. The leading flange is first inserted. There's a little alligator forcep that we talked about. Then inserted. P tube is tipped so the pore can be seen. Phototopical drops are instilled. Cotton ball is placed and smarts the end of the procedure. That's about how fast it is in real life, too. Honestly. Very quick, very fast. going to spend more time in pre-op than they are mm -hmm. during the actual procedure. For sure. It's, so it's if, super fast. So what if your day consists of one, you know, bilateral myringotomy? <laughs> <laughs> you need to find something else to keep yourself busy, Jonathan. Oh, I'd hope so. <laughs> um, you know, then you're, you uh, resort to busy work like stocking rooms and seeing if sterile processing needs any help, and uh, seeing if you can jump into another room and steal a case. Um, yeah, so it's... Um, Walk up to somebody, please give me your case. <laughs> yeah, like, hey, you're just um, <laughs> play solitaire. That's a bad joke, Tori. That's a really bad joke. We're not nurses, so we might be able to get away with it. Um, what was they gonna say? Uh, oh, yeah, I know I was going to say my friend Linda, who is a scrub tech as well, she's, um, she would come in and like, you'd be opening stuff for your case and she'd get her gloves and she'd pop them on the field and she'd be like, it's my case now, my gloves are on the table. Um, you know, so you can always use that approach. I, uh. I had to laugh at one of my students, graduate now, but way back when in my past life, um, she was actually doing her externship in um, uh, Payson, in Payson. And uh, this was her choice. It wasn't somewhere that we put her where she had to drive far away. And uh, so I would go up there every couple of weeks to visit her and, you know, see how she was doing. And uh, so I always tell everyone in orientation, I'm like, look, you find something to do so that you can get your hours. I don't care if it's like scrubbing wheels or <laughs> walls, whatever the case may be, do whatever you can to like get your hours. So she sends me this picture and she is, uh, Rulan, you'll get a kick out of this. She is um, inside one of the gigantic sterilizers with a bucket and a scrub brush scrubbing the sterilizer. <laughs> She's like, I'm getting my hours, Miss Winder. I really wanted to know. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah, so good thing they didn't, like, put her in there and shut the door and cook her up. But they didn't. She's just a little cute thing, just a little, little thing, too. So, um, anyways, yeah. That's what I guess we would do. Scrub sterilizers, scrub floors, stock rooms, you know, whatever we can do. Um, good. Excellent. So we talked about positioning. We talked about drugs. Any questions about the procedure itself? Well, we yeah. want to hear more yeah, about you the rest of the story. <laughs> what? The whole story we you heard. cut off. Oh, <laughs> no. Are you kidding? <laughs> 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 it was, it was 
Oh man, I was just saying about my student, how she, um, how I tell them that they have to get all of their hours. And uh, so she sent me a picture. She was inside a sterilizer scrubbing it with like a bucket and a scrub brush, like scrubbing the sterilizer. She sends me a picture. She's like, I'm getting my hours. And uh, yeah, so I said, whatever it takes, get your hours. Uh, we're all having technical difficulties. Ian texted me. He's having, he's having technical difficulties. Tammy was having technical difficulties. Robbie, I think, had technical difficulties, so maybe this is the day for it. I think I'm technically a difficulty, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, it de for me, it depends on who you ask. <laughs> all right, okay, so questions about the procedure at all, the steps. You'll, you'd be able to write like a little summary of the steps. Okay. Do you want me to post that video? Does anybody think they need it? Yeah, post it. Okay. Yep, would be nice. I can do that right after we finish up our session here. I made myself a note. Okay. Last piece of the puzzle um, is a Rainey's group. Yep. And uh, they're going to talk about pre-op and post-op considerations for the patient. Do you need to share anything? No, I don't think so. That's just words. Okay, perfect. Um, and team, please jump in in case I forget something, because um, we had a pretty good discussion going about it, and I was trying to take notes. Um, so operative considerations, both pre and post. Um, so typically in littles, this is done under general anesthesia in a hospital. And in the bigs or the grown-ups, they'll do it with a local, like a lidocaine drop, typically in adults. So, you know, pre-op is going to be very different, obviously. So if you're, it's just a lidocaine drop, you don't have to do MPO. Um, but they do say that you should limit any sort of NSAIDs, um, you know, just to help reduce any sort of anticoagulation. Um, and... So with the littles, they're going to have to, you know, do MPO. And it seems like what we found really was dependent on the age of the kiddo. Um, like infants, their um, duration of, you know, prior to surgery was substantially less than the bigs. Um, and that included chewing gum, just in case anybody remembers or doesn't remember. Um, and then for post-op, um, basically they kind of said, you know, that they limit their diet to just liquid diets for 24 hours just because the chewing can cause some pain. Um, they can have some Tylenol post-op, but typically there isn't a lot of pain. Um, I remember from like when I was way back in school, um, that they said it actually was pain relief by having those tubes put in because it typically, you know, they would drain the fluid and so it would take out that bulging. Um, the, there are to expect drainage for 48 hours post-op. Um, they're going to get prescription eardrops. Um, they're not to put anything in their ears bigger than their elbow or smaller than their elbow. Um, and it's okay for them to shower, but that they really can't um, spend any time with their heads submerged without Q-tips for risk of infection and, you know, potentially flooding your brain or something, right? Um, mm -hmm. I think that's all we have. Does that sound good to you girls? Did I forget anything? For the most part, I think they had, uh, like, there was some conversation about the healing time and post-operative about... Yeah usually about four weeks, and then they have that 24-hour post-op appointment, um, but also generally the tubes are supposed to kind of be pushed out uh, within about 12 months, and it, it might be possible for them to have to be surgically removed. Very interesting. Very good. Good coverage, ladies. Ian, did you have a question? I saw I bet your little ham was up. Are you okay? Um, I, my computer decided to absolutely freak out with Zoom, so I had to 
pull it up on my phone and I was trying to figure out how to use chat just to say I was back and I pressed the wrong button. So no question. No. Okay. Good. Thank good. You. Glad you're back. Um, no, I think, I think that about covers it. Do we mention like pre-op antibiotics at all? Like prophylaxis? A lot of times they'll give that like an hour before surgery or they'll hang it in pre-op pretty much across the board. Um, couple other things that I thought of um, as far as positioning some things to think about is um, depending on what side they're starting with or working on, they're just going to want the head turned so that ear is available. So supine with the head turned. Um, and you might have said that. If you did, I apologize. Um, and then a safety strap, right? So there's like that safety belt that we put on um, the patient. So we're going to want to make sure they have a safety strap. And the only uh, some kind of other weird things for this, we just wear gloves. Um, we don't wear gowns. So we're just going to put on sterile gloves for ourselves and for the, we'll put sterile gloves on the surgeon, but we won't wear a gown with that. And so we call that open gloving. So we'll do that. And um, we don't need a back table. So we're just gonna use the Mayo stand and maybe a tiny little prep table, but for the most part. That's it. <laughs> Our computers all have viruses. All this talk about germs. Okay, that's awesome. Great job, everyone. Questions about anything that we've talked about, about the BMT, um, the case preparation record should be attached to the lab um, for today in today's content. So you can just pull that up, type in your stuff. If um, So this case prep record does have like suture material. It asks for you to list that. It asks for you to list needles and blades. Um, if there is something that isn't applicable, you can just put none or you can put NA or you can put not applicable or don't need this or something like that. But don't just leave it blank. Um, go ahead and put something, plug something in there so I at least know that you looked at it. Um, it's also going to ask the surgeon's name. If you want to entertain me, you can make up an interesting name there, but keep it clean. Um, and uh, you know, that's about it. So it should be pretty straightforward. I think we have all the, um, a it asks for prep. And a lot of times we don't use prep solution. Um, there, the majority of prep solutions out there are not, uh, are contraindicated for use in the ear that they could damage the um, tympanic membrane. So we usually just like if they have, um, like if they have long hair, maybe just have them pull it back um, in a ponytail or something, but otherwise um, not a whole lot of prep that goes on there. So um, for that, and then drapes we talked about would be our towels. Uh, we just do like a head wrap for the most part and that's it. Um, we talked about equipment, we have sterile supplies, you have your, the synopsis of the procedure is just going to be your little summary of um, the steps. You could do bullet points if you want. Um, and then post-op considerations that were discussed. Um, and then instruments. Um, and then I think you'll have it. So I think we have all the parts that we need to do that. Um, at this point, um, I will start the Kahoot, we can do that, and then I will let you add it. If you wanna handwrite this too, uh, you can do that too, I'm fine if you wanna handwrite it, okay? Um, but if you guys wanna take a quick break while I'm getting Kahoot queued up, um, it, that should take us about 10 or 15 minutes, and then that'll be that, okay? All right, I will get that started for us. So, Miss Windsor, have you ever ruptured your eardrum? Like, I never had tubes, but I've ruptured my eardrum. No, I never had. Um, but my, and I'm deaf in my right ear now because of an incident I had about, I don't know, 14 years ago. But I had, oh, chronic, right. yeah, I had chronic ear infections <laughs> in my right ear. 
So um, I just refer to that as the complaint department now, but. I crashed on a wakeboard. Oh. Just exploded it. It was really weird though, because like I had fluid draining out of it for a while because it pushed water into my ear. And then after that, I could breathe through my ear. It was a little weird. <laughs> oh, I can't even imagine that. So how is it now, your ear? Mm -hmm. it, it, I guess it's okay. I mean, I don't notice anything. It healed up. Yeah. But it, it was really weird to notice that and then to recognize like when I couldn't pull air in and out through my ear anymore. So I just wonder what that's like for people that have the tubes. Like, what is, I, I can't even imagine what that sensation is. I mean, having experienced that. Yeah, it's probably a little bit similar, I would say. Um, and sometimes we have individuals that um, have to have surgery when they rupture their eardrum. If it doesn't heal, then what they do is a, what they call a um, tympanoplasty. And they're going to the tragus right here, this little piece of, of little cartilage in the front of our ear. Um, they can harvest the, um, there's like a thin membrane that covers it. So they'll incise the skin and like dissect that off. And then they'll use that to just, um, they, they use this special little tool. It's so weird that like um, squishes it and like flattens it out. And um, then they just poke it down inside the ear and then pack the ear. And what do they pack it with? I can't even remember. So it's not like they super glue that little flap and cover it up or? Nope, nope. They just poke it down in there and um, put some packing in there. And, and it, they, um, I know one thing they do is they take like a little tiny curette that like has a rough edge and they'll like rough up like the tissue, like kind of get it bleeding a little bit right down around where the tympanic membrane attaches so that it will hopefully like grow in, you know, it'll stick. Um, and then fine after that. Interesting. Yeah, it's crazy. I did quite a bit at ENT in the first part of my career life, uh, about the first 10 years. Um, but then I went to a surgery center and they didn't do ENT there. So, um, you know, we, they did, the, the nurses didn't want to take care of kids, babies. So um, they didn't bring in an ENT at all, <laughs> I guess. That's why, I don't know. But um, yeah, I, we, I remember the first tympanoplasty I did I was working with this surgeon and he was quite persnickety. Um, and uh, I'm going to stop recording because I don't think.